This talk will be given by Dr. Onur Ishchi, who is an assistant professor of international relations and director of the Center for Russian Studies at Bilkent University in Ankara. Dr. Ishchi's research focuses on Russian-Turkish relations and his book, Turkey and the Soviet Union during World War II, Diplomacy, Discord and International Relations, was published last year by Ivy Tarras. His talk today is on Turkish diplomacy and the 1936 Montreux Convention. Just before I hand over to Dr. Ishchi, the next talk in our series will be on Thursday, December the 3rd at 16.30 UK time and will be given by Professor Eugel Yanikdar from the University of Richmond. Professor Yanikdar will be speaking on military masculinity under fire, suffering and manhood in the Ottoman First World War. I now hand over to Dr. Ishchi. Um, Ebru and Kate, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, it's very, very, very good to see you. Uh, I guess it's been two years since we held a conference at the Skiller Center on Interwar uh, Mobility. Uh, and my paper today will be broadly speaking about the interwar period. Um, when I was asked to give a title for this, for this paper, uh, I did try to emphasize the Montreux Convention. Uh, but but the title the titles can generally be misleading. Um, what I will actually do uh, today is put the, the Montreux Convention of 1936, which is a turning point in early Republican Turkish diplomacy, within the broader context of Soviet Turkish relations and Turkey's inner war uh, uh, in a war uh, to the, the world around Turkey during the inner war period. Uh, so in, in that sense, it's uh, quite similar to. Uh, what I presented at um, the conference at the Skiller Center two years ago. Uh, I, I did again speak about Turkish Soviet relations, this time about a completely different region, Eastern Anatolia, uh, and joint Soviet Turkish ventures uh, that, quite, that didn't quite fit in uh, the, the broader territorializing world of the interwar period. Uh, this uh, paper. Uh, I should say, is a, is a product of um, a similar workshop that was held in uh, Columbia University in New York a, a, about six months before our conference at Cambridge, actually. Uh, and it was about the Black Sea and <clears throat> the Black Sea world. And again, my presentation didn't quite fit in, this time chronologically, because I wasn't speaking about the Ottomans. So uh, I really love the title of your, your, your new, uh, very exciting series, Ottomans Online. Uh, I will be speaking about the successors uh, of uh, the uh, the crumbled Ottoman state um, uh, after the Great War. Um, and my broader purpose is not necessarily to, uh, in this paper, I'm not trying to come up with new and unheard of documents about the Montreux Convention. They're, they're, they're there at the League of Nations. Uh, if, you, if you search online, I think we can can pretty much access uh, uh, the treaty uh, at Montreux and, and, and the articles listed on, to, on the Montreux, and we know the significance. What I'd like to do uh, instead is point out to where the story belongs to in uh, Turkey's interwar uh, diplomacy. Um, and, and what I do in my, my research is to look at uh, Turkey's relations with the Soviet Union uh, in general during uh, the, in, um, after the Great War, all the way through the Cold War. My new research uh, includes actually the Cold War years, uh, but there was a point about two years ago when I was doing uh, research in, in, in Russia uh, on diplomatic archives of Russia and Turkey, uh, and my access to the Turkish archives, uh, the Turkish diplomatic archives, uh, was very limited and arbitrary. Uh, and I say this in pretty much most of the uh, Zoom webinars that I'm invited to give a talk at, uh, because uh, archives are very important, uh, and we don't really, uh, unlike the Ottoman archives, uh, in the we don't really have access to Turkey's Republican uh, archives, and, and I would like to start off with with uh, a comparison here uh, to make it clear to our audience as to the kind of documents that I work with for, for my talk today. Um, it, it's very easy uh, to get into the archives in Turkey. I, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the Turkish archives, particularly the formerly known as Republican archives, now 
cataloged under uh, the state archives. It's, 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 it's very easy to get in, uh, but it's very difficult to find interesting stuff about the Republican period. This is very much unlike Russian archives, where it's very difficult to get in, but once you're in, uh, you actually have your hands on very, very interesting stuff, and and are actually you you are aided or you, you you're guided by uh, by some very very intelligent archivists and, and and historians, I would say, and 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 this is this paper today is the product uh, of of this coincidental. I mean, I came across a bunch of very interesting documents about Montreux, uh, and with this long introduction. Uh, uh, I, I should say that this paper actually looks at <clears throat> the post-war international order, uh, and it's it is about Turkey and, and Ankara and Moscow and relations between these two states, uh, but it is also about you know their bitterness against uh, the the post-war international order. So beginning in 1920, um, this bitterness drove uh, Soviet-Turkish relations uh, and nationalist Turks and we say Bolsheviks who come from very different ends of the political spectrum, ideologically speaking, laid to rest four centuries of rivalry between their imperial predecessors. Uh, and uh, they found themselves in an unusual convergence that each side decided to define as anti-imperialist. Um, so at the heart of their cooperation was a geopolitical alignment, which sought to shield the greater Black Sea region from Western intrusions, um, and this 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 area, this the Black Sea, uh, was what divided these two states, uh, their their predecessors for centuries, and what they fought over for for hundreds of years, um, and it's it's become almost like a, a compulsory phrase to start off any narrative about Turkey and and Russia, right? This warfare between uh, the Romanovs and and the Ottomans. Um, but but in this in this so with this article uh, uh, with, with this paper I'm trying to show that equally uh, after the Great War both sides share the commitment to the creation of of modern states and the interwar exchange between uh, Ankara and Moscow uh, was was has been aptly called an anti-Western uh, alliance on the European periphery. Uh, but, but, you know, it was a meaningful partnership uh, and all the way until the final hours of peace in Europe in 1939, before World War II, the first principle that guided Turkish diplomacy was actually good neighborly relations with Moscow in the context of friendship rather than subordination. Uh, so here we're talking about a new beginning, uh, a, a new uh, relationship uh, uh, initiated by two governments that are trying that were trying to you know build new states on the rubble of failed empires um, so Turkey's leaders repeatedly stressed that they perceived all other alliances during the interwar period comp as complementary to, to Turkey's anti-imperialist coalition with Russia and that was in quotation marks uh, a very common phrase uh, uh, commonly used phrase uh, uh, by Ataturk and, and Ismet Inunu. But the Soviet-Turkish uh, tension during the Cold War after World War II contributed to a widely held view that somehow the default nature of these two states' relationship was chronically hostile uh, and inherently destabilizing. Uh, and, and in the context of these previous centuries of struggle uh, between their imperial predecessors, there is a certain logic and I admit that, uh, to the portrayal of this interwar friendship between Ankara and Moscow as a short-lived pragmatic alignment in an otherwise conflict-prone affair that resumed after World War II. And so before the Soviet and much more recently Turkish archives that uh, you know, that became accessible, scholars who, who approached uh, Soviet-Turkish relations during the interwar period treated their political meaning in terms defined narrowly by geopolitics. Uh, and, and perhaps in the Q&A session, I'll, I'll have the opportunity to come back to this uh, because I think, and I, I'm convinced that there's people who study Russia and Turkey in other uh, decades of the 20th century or now by international relations scholars or political scientists, they still, they still do uh, have a propensity to look at this relationship 
from a very narrow monolithic geopolitical prism to perceive these two states uh, as, as geopolitical entities and nothing else, while in fact uh, they, were, uh, they were driven by motivations uh, other than geopolitical expansion, particularly during the interwar, peri <laughs> interwar period. They were driven by development to catch up uh, with the West, to, to somehow uh, defeat this disparity with what they both defined as Western power. The Bolsheviks and Kemalists came from very different ideologies, but what, what binded them or what, what the common denominator there was their common perception of the West, the Western power in economic terms. And so, um, but what we still, in, in existing literature, if you look at, I mean, you pick up any article or book um, that, that, that comes before you uh, that defines Turkey and Russia, you, you see that as a corollary to this geopolitical understanding, many accounts, many of these books, will maintain that cordial Soviet-Turkish relations, this short-lived honeymoon, uh, ended rather predictably at the Montreux Convention of 1936. And this is partly why I wanted to uh, uh, talk about Montreux today. Um, and, and, and it's very natural because an age-old geopolitical dispute that that consumed uh, both empires, the Ottomans in defense and the Russians in more expansionist uh, uh, strategies uh, in the 19th century, right? The Straits question was at the heart of the Eastern question. And who gets to control uh, the Straits uh, when you know, it's almost analogous we used as who gets to control the spoil, who gets more of the share of the, of the spoils of the Ottoman Empire. Um, and, you know, very naturally after World War II, when you look at the literature, you see that, uh, you know, with emerging Soviet demands over the, the, the Straits, um, it, it draw a, veg, a wedge between two natural enemies. And most of the accounts will tell you that by, in 1936, uh, over a geopolitical issue, uh, the two states got uh, found themselves at odds with one another. But, but such notions of historic enmity actually exist more in the works of scholars uh, rather than in the words of historical actors at the time. Because sco scores of Turkish diplomatic records, and this is why I stressed it at the beginning of my talk, how important to see the language, the discourse, not the official discourse, but the internal correspondence in the Turkish diplomatic records, uh, scores of them are being uh, declassified right now, and, and they show that Soviet-Turkish, you know, partnership remained intact after Montreux, uh, but not after the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. So uh, the Columbia University workshop on the Black Sea, where I presented an earlier draft of this paper, I had the opportunity to develop it into uh, and develop it and publish it in, in Kritika, which actually. Uh, uh, was published last week, uh, this paper. So I, I thought that this would be a good opportunity to, uh, you know, share some insights beyond, uh, beyond the ward limits presented by the editors uh, at Critica. Um, and I, and, and, and I want to talk about uh, the, the, this, this anti-imperialist uh, bond uh, that, that brought together the two states. Now, if we look at the accounts, uh, of, of that that wrote about that that that's uh, uh, that explores Turkish Russian relations that mostly almost exclusively point out uh, the Montreux Convention as the end of friendly relations. Um, the question then remains if Soviet Turkish convergence during the interwar period was just a temporary geopolitical alignment, how could Moscow and Ankara disagree over the principle? geopolitical challenge, the straits, but then continue to talk about joint anti-imperialist endeavors and, and juxtaposing uh, key holdings from both Russian and Turkish uh, foreign ministerial archives. Um, what, what my paper does today is a probe into the diplomatic exchanges uh, between Ankara and Moscow. Uh, I'll spare you most of the details of this economic, uh, you know, the trivial uh, parts of it, and we'll try to you know, emphasize the broader significance of the subject. Uh, but I need to show uh, how after Montreux, there was a, even a thin ray of hope for a bilateral military pact on the Black Sea 
that would ward off, in quotation marks, uh, uh, imperialist penetration. Um, ultimately, uh, uh, my, my, the documents that I was able to look at and, and, and study showed me that a, sig a more significant cooperation was achieved in the economic sphere. If we're talking about two states that ended their friendly relations after a geopolitical challenge, then how do you explain, I ask myself, this, this leap in economic cooperation after Montreux, right? Uh, so um, these, uh, the, the developments in Turkish-Soviet uh, economic exchange demonstrate that I think a Black Sea logic was central in the Turkish thinking, that Mustafa Kemal's and Inunu's insistence on friendship with the Turkish, with, with the Soviet Union as the primary goal of their foreign policy needs to be taken seriously. Uh, and the Soviet Union, in turn, courted Turkey as an ally, uh, including after Montreux. And continued economic cooperation after 1936 is much more than pointing out to a chronological fallacy in, in historical scholarship. It's not like, you know, I wrote an article that says huh, the friendship did not end at Montreux, but in 1939, uh, it may seem trivial, but it is not because the political meanings behind uh, these two very significant events, that is the Montreux Convention and Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, actually explains the very nature of what drove these two states uh, during the entire interwar period. Uh, so it's, it's beyond uh, pointing out to a, a chronological problem in, in historiography. Um, but perhaps more importantly, it, it, it shows that much more than a pragmatic alignment, Moscow and Ankara saw partnership on the Black Sea as a key response to what they both referred to as imperialist threats from without. This is an article that I, uh, the, the critical article in my paper today that I'm presenting, a summary of the article. Uh, is a product that I, I worked on after my, my, my book, which, it, which talks about the Second World War. Uh, and I, I think that in that way, while looking at the interwar period, um, I, I, I try to understand the nature of this, this relationship, which I think showed me a thread that binds these two states across the past century. And that at the risk of, you know, I, I don't know, uh, defaming my own work, my own book. Uh, I think that, you know, my book talks about, and I realized this after this, after publishing it, 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 it talks, to, it details how a relationship broke, broke down, right? But it is an anomaly within the broader scheme of things. Uh, and in that way, the interwar relations uh, between Ankara and Moscow uh, shows us. Uh, you know, beyond what other scholars define as a geopolitical, uh, um, pragmatic uh, union. Uh, after Montreux, uh, this is not so much black or white. I mean, the, nuance, the, the nuances there are so strong that makes it a lot more, comp uh, it makes it a very complex story, right? When I say that, you know, anti-imperialist, you know, friendship, uh, Ankara, Moscow, economic exchange, do you know, don't think that these are two states that that trusted one another like uh, to death, right? They just found uh, a common purpose uh, after hundreds of years of warfare that when they work together, they actually can challenge uh, Western hegemony. And so after Montreux, both Soviet and Turkish leaders, if you read through the diplomatic records, uh, amongst themselves, but not only officially, but like more private conversations, you see that they both lament that the whole world, they said, seemed to have become aware of their dwindling attachment, right? So you can see that they also knew that the whole world would interpret the, the Montreux uh, breakdown of affairs as somehow the end of uh, 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 Soviet-Turkish um, uh, relations during the interwar period. But but they also, these two governments sought to address the tension uh, and took very dramatic steps in the late 1930s after Montreux uh, to prolong cooperation, and particularly in the economic sphere. And uh, these attempts to maintain the partnership 
after the challenge of Montreux, I think reveal much about the nature of Soviet-Turkish relations in general throughout the 20th century. And indeed, as undeniable tensions grew over geopolitical conflict, uh, all the way until 1939, uh, when the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact demonstrated that one party had aligned with an expansionist power outside the region, that is Nazi Germany, uh, Moscow and Ankara shared a sense that their interests overlapped in defense of the Black Sea. Um, and I, I think, uh, you know, in that sense, my work um, sort of uh, is in keeping with new literature uh, that, that suggests that by the beginning of the 20th century, even as a late uh, Imperial Russian and Ottoman relations, the major powers on either side of the Black Sea had increasingly begun to see the convergence as the basis of their relationship. So, so, um, so, so my, my argument here, uh, I guess, is in keeping with this recent scholarship on Soviet-Turkish relations and shows that anachronistic notions of Russo-Ottoman geopolitical rivalry are radically at odds with the Weltanschauung of modern Turkey's policymakers and also the Soviet policymakers. When Turkey's new leaders uh, looked at their truncated country after the Great War and the world around it, uh, they did so with hope, but also with restraint. Uh, in 1939, uh, the British ambassador, Percy Lorraine, captured this tension when he said of Ankara, the sick man has left behind a number of lusty children who were acutely aware of their limitations. Uh, the new capital uh, in, in, in Anatolia, Ankara, was, was more isolated from its Western neighbors, metaphorically, as much as physically. Uh, until the 1930s, uh, many European states um, maintained their embassies uh, in Istanbul. Uh, the famous, uh, now it's a nightclub, I guess a private club, Soho building, used to be the US embassy until they moved it again, uh, not until the 30s, now in the, all throughout the 1920s. Um, Ankara felt that it was abandoned in a way. Uh, the British, uh, I, I've attended, I had the, the opportunity to attend a bunch of receptions at the British Embassy in Ankara, beautiful building. Uh, uh, I, I, I pointed out to uh, some of the ambassadors that, you know, it, it's great that you have this building, um, but you know, there's this, uh, there's this gap in the 1920s and in the formative stage of any state at this very ambivalent period, the 1920s, I don't think it was, uh, it was very confusing and ambivalent period to say the least. Uh, and if you're a new state trying to, you know, build, build up on the rubble of a failed empire, the idea that you're being, you're not even being recognized uh, uh, is, um, must have been uh, uh, difficult, but also this underlying motive, all I'm trying to say is crucial for understanding Turkey's priorities and the immediate post-war environment. Uh, when I read uh, the memoirs of uh, Turkey's, um, one of Turkey's first parliament members, uh, you can see that there are a lot of questions brought up in the parliament about the amount of alcohol consumed in the Soviet embassy. All I'm trying to get at is that the Soviet embassy was the first, you know, embassy, the Georgian embassy, but then, you know, absorbed by the Soviet Union. Uh, the Soviet embassy was the, was the first building uh, and it was a mecca for Turkey's uh, policymakers. There was the restaurant, Baba Karpic, right? Karpic, uh, Baba restaurant. Uh, the first, George, this was a Georgian uh, restaurant in Ankara that on Ataturk's orders was moved from Istanbul. And there was the Soviet, the Soviet embassy. There was, you know, the lights were constantly on, uh, right? And you need to read the memoirs to understand the, re, the, the mindset of Turkey's, you know, uh, I don't know, founding fathers, I guess. Uh, and, and, it, and I think that a critical question for early Republican Turkish diplomacy in that sense um, was, was its relations with uh, the Soviet Union. But they had very concrete problems that were left unresolved at the Lausanne Convention uh, right before the proclamation of the Republic. So um, uh, in that sense, uh, Turkey's priorities during the interwar period, if you look at it, was mainly um, geared towards solving 
some of the problems that were left unresolved uh, at Lausanne. Uh, and the Straits question was a priority, right? Uh, it, it, the Straits served as a key tra trading route for Black Sea littoral states as, and as a passage for their um, navies. Uh, the Straits question had long been an intrinsic part of the larger problem known as the Eastern question, you know, encompassing a, a, a strategic fault line that stretched from the Mediterranean to the Black Sea. Uh, and on the, eaves of, uh, on the eve of the Republic's establishment, Ankara at Lausanne was vexed about the existing regime of naval passage through Dardanelles and Bosphorus, as that passage took four navies through the heart of Istanbul. But there were you know, other problems and priorities to resolve, such as the annulment of the Ottoman capitulations granted to Western powers and recognition of Turkey's sovereignty rights in Eastern Thrace and uh, Asia Minor. Hence, uh, at the Lausanne Convention Conference in 1922 and in the second round in 1923, uh, which replaced the Sev Treaty of 1920, uh, Turkey agreed to demilitarize the Straits and transfer their control to an international convention. Uh, for, for, those, for, for those in the audience who are not familiar with the, the, the governing regimes of the Straits, this was what happened when the Turkish state was, was found. Uh, and once again, behind Turkey's reconciliation or this attitude regarding the Lausanne Convention, friendship with the Soviet Union, uh, I think, loomed large. And, uh, and you know, there was a point when at the Lausanne Convention, uh, the first People's Commissar for Foreign Affairs of the Soviet Union, uh, Georgi Chicherin, was portrayed by English newspapers with a fez uh, on his head. And by Turkish newspapers, uh, by some caricatures, uh, they portrayed him as more Turk. Uh, they, they, told, they, they, they were trying to portray him as more Turkish than the Turks themselves uh, at the con con conference. What is, uh, what was, what strikes me, what is remarkable, I think, uh, about Lausanne and Turkey's, you know, concessions uh, at Lausanne uh, is this emphasis on economic sovereignty. And I think that in a world, in the 21st century, now growingly defined by growing authoritarian or by author rising authoritarianisms and geopolitical chaos within a multipolar world order, we begin to see, look at the past uh, in a skewed light or through a skewed prism, and that we fail to understand uh, that, that states are inherently acting on a geopolitical logic. They don't. They, they're especially, if you, if you, in Eric Hobsbawm's terminology, if you look at Turkey and Russia as the uh, balances of stability, like the they were forces of stability in Eric Hobsbawm's language, right, during the interwar period. And Hobsbawm himself, and including Zara Steiner, uh, these are historians that I love and I, you know, I don't know, memorize their works. Uh, and I'm really amazed by uh, these two late professors' imaginings of the interwar period. Uh, and they're, uh, as much as I do appreciate it, I actually, you know, I, I can see that they're not necessarily on point. Uh, about Turkey, for instance, uh, because geopolitical stability uh, was, was, of course, very important. I'm not denying that. But it was much more than geopolitics, right? This IR, international relations reading of history, is problematic because when you have to establish a state, the first thing you look at is your poorness, that you exist as an economic entity. And, and, and you're, you're driven by impulses for development. The first, like, the end goal is to be a developed state, right? And, and you know, we may have, we don't, maybe not have so much time to get into you know, the, the politics of economic development, which is a term that's mainly associated with the Cold War, by the way, these, uh, these days. It was, and Turkey was a laboratory for the Soviet Union uh, to, uh, to help and assist and develop. And, and, and to be honest, um, the Straits, where do we read the Straits uh, conflict in Soviet-Turkish relations in all of this? Uh, so this, uh, so my 
both my talk and, 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 and the article that I wrote point out to uh, the significance of this, uh, this economic cooperation uh, between Ankara and Moscow as the reason why they were ignoring uh, their differences. Uh, in 1923, immediately after the proclamation of the Republic, the first important event in Turkish history is the Izmir uh, Congress, the Economics Congress, Izmir Iktisat Congress, right? Uh, and I, I highly encourage uh, those, those among the audience, if they're interested in this argument, to actually, it's, on, it's accessible online, to read through the script of, and the talks at Izmir Iktisat Congress to understand Turkey's priorities, whether it was you know, uh, more geopolitical or more economic. Um, and I think that I, I, I need to, I, I'm, I'm risking my own time here in this talk, but, but because Montreux had, has become so popular lately in Turkey and the Straits through this uh, bizarre Istanbul Canal project, um, but, but more, much more than Istanbul Canal, uh, Canal Istanbul, uh, Lausanne, the founding, treaty right before the proclamation of the republic has become such a bone of contention uh, amongst politi like, political leaders of uh, today's Turkey who think that they have some sort of understanding of history, right? Uh, who criticized Lausanne as a diplomatic defeat by emphasizing the concessions, geopolitical concessions given uh, to secure economic sovereignty, I think that uh, it just makes much more sense to talk a little bit about this, right? The Aegean Islands two weeks ago was, uh, was on newspapers in Turkey. Uh, the Straits question is something else. But, you know, what, what we have here uh, is a political reading uh, of history. And, and I think that by, by looking at actual archival documents, from, uh, from Ankara, from, from Turkey and Russia, uh, I, I was hoping to give a, a fuller picture of what was happening uh, at Montreux, because Montreux was clearly a victory uh, for, for Turkey and, uh, and, and its allies, but not so much a victory for, for the Soviet Union. Uh, now, uh, the Soviet Union uh, had, had always preferred to see the Black Sea as a Mare Closen, a closed sea. Their whole argument, uh, in fact, this kind of is a continuation of the Russian imperial argument too, in the sense that since the Black Sea is a closed sea, which has no exits to other seas, it has to be controlled by uh, the littoral riparian states, right? A, a regime about the tonnage of navies in the Black Sea should be only determined by littoral states. Uh, Turkey's reservations in, the 1930, in 1936 was such that as the sole custodian of the only entry into the Black Sea, uh, it bears a burden that is larger than it can absorb and neither the Soviet Union nor, you know, nor, nor Great Britain would actually come to its help in the case, for instance, of rising Italian revisionism. Uh, and Italian revisionism in the mid-1930s uh, was, was the primary cause for Turkey's um, decision to move forward with a revision of the Lausanne Straits regime. And in 1936, they did actually um, uh, uh, revise it at Montreux. Um, the ambivalence of this period was on display during uh, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk's visit to what I just referred to as Mecca for early Tur Republican Turks, the Soviet embassy, uh, uh, for the celebrations of the 13th anniversary of the establishment of the Turkish Republic. So on October 29th, 1936, just three months after Montreux had been signed, Ataturk arrived uh, at the Soviet embassy uh, on his state's most important holiday. And in some sense, his visit was not particularly unusual. And because, as I've explained, during the peak of the Soviet-Turkish collaboration, the Soviet embassy was, was, was really gathering grounds for Ankara's new leaders. 
And one of the uh, particular participants uh, recalled that rather unlimited amounts of vodka and caviar were served over politics. Uh, for the 1936 uh, celebrations, uh, Ambassador Lev Karahan, uh, uh, who had been the vice uh, foreign minister of the Soviet Union, by the way, uh, had an unusual, had secured an unusual attendance of Turkey's political elite, including Prime Minister Inunu, Foreign Minister Tevfik Gushtu Aras, and Atatürk was not an expected guest. Uh, he turned up at half past two in the morning, after midnight, uh, according to the Russian records in high spirits, uh, with relations as they were, uh, these nocturnal conversations proved very awkward. Ataturk uh, arrived with an orchestra and um, his family and, and friends, and his behavior suggested that he was frustrated with his Soviet hosts. At 2.30 a.m., uh, um, he, uh, he took Karahan, uh, Lev Karahan aside and demanded to know why Stalin had not met with him personally after so many years. And these are from, again, the Russian diplomatic archives, uh, this, this bit, this analogy. Uh, he, he seemed as if he wanted to put the frustrations behind him. Um, but he wanted to know uh, whether Stalin in, was indifferent to such a meeting with Ataturk or deliberately ignoring him. Uh, that was his, his lines in quotation marks again. And he claimed to be offended that instead of the, the leader of the Soviet Union, Comrade Kalinin, which by the way, not many people took very seriously, had sent him uh, a laconic congratulatory telegraph on the anniversary of Turkey's independence. Just three years before, uh, on the 10th anniversary uh, of the, the Turkish Republic, the proclamation of the Republic, uh, the Soviet Union sent one of the highest uh, people uh, of, of their entourage to Turkey, uh, which you can find um, in a documentary called um, uh, Ankara, Heart of Turkey, uh, Ankara, Serce Turzi. Uh, it's, a, it's a Russian documentary that you, you see, for instance, Ataturk's 10th year speech from, right? It's a very interesting uh, story. Apparently, and the, the point is, three years earlier, uh, relations uh, were presented to the entire world as something very different. So I understand how some scholars uh, might actually interpret these sourness uh, in, you know, just three years later after Montreux as something uh, of a problem. Um, and, and, and Karahan reported the next morning that uh, Atatürk was visibly irritated uh, as he insisted that he was a friend of the Soviet Union that this friendship would, would exist as long as he lived, but that he could maintain this friendship only on reciprocal grounds. Karahan, you know, kind of promised him to arrange a meeting with Stalin, which we all know was impossible. Stalin, Ataturk never left uh, in a war period, security, all of that. Uh, that never happened. Uh, but far from mollified, Ataturk reiterated resentment for recent insolence. Uh, albeit with a further proclamation of loyalty. Uh, amidst these, these, these vacillations of mood, Ataturk let slip that he respected Russia, Soviet Russia, with a strong, disciplined, and mechanized army, but that he was not afraid of anyone as there were 18 million Turks behind him. Again, quotation marks. Uh, his tirade continued with further exhortations about the need for continued alliance with Ankara and Moscow, uh, and, and you know, Atatürk knew that Soviets were unhappy with some of the clauses in the new Straits regime at Montreux uh, that introduced Turkey's full sovereignty over the Bosphorus and Dardanelles, uh, as well as precise limitations on naval tonnage in the Black Sea for littoral and non-littoral states. He referred to the non-littoral limitations as a yardstick uh, and, and ran with a metaphor. Figuratively, he told uh, Karahan that Collaboration across the Black Sea was a much more meaningful yardstick for appraising Soviet-Turkish friendship than any of the Montreux clauses. I think like, so I came across, when I came across this, uh, this document, I was, um, I, I got really excited. And, and that's the, the end result is the, is the, pro, is the product. Uh, the end product is, the, is this article. And I'm gonna wrap up very soon. I know that I'm, you know, uh, getting to the very end in just one or two minutes. 
uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, this visit, this analogy, and there are many more, uh, demonstrated the tension that emerged after Montreux that I'm not denying, uh, but also Montreux's place within a broader context. Karahan immediately transmitted his record of the conversation shortly after Atatürk had retired with his entourage at 7 a.m. from the Soviet embassy. 7 a.m. in the morning, he left, uh, and the orchestra stopped playing. Uh, and a few months later, uh, Stalin took an interest in the report that Karahan shared with him and circulated to the Soviet political elite with the suggestion that they would find interesting the words of their friend Atatürk. So the cynicism, uh, Stalin's quotation marks around the word friend, matched the vis you know, that visible in Atatürk's reference to the strength of his army and the 18 million Turks standing behind him. Uh, yet Stalin's description of Atatürk as a friend also alluded to a momentum that Montreux alone was not enough to break. Uh, it would be wrong to misconstrue this meeting at the Soviet embassy as evidence that Ankara and Moscow's honeymoon had ended. Uh, in 1937, Atatürk quietly observed, and I always found this, this, this bit uh, somehow resembling Tolstoy in, in the beginning of Anna Karenina, but Atatürk quietly observed that even the happiest families have minor spats, but that does not lead them to fall apart. Uh, and in the face of a widening gap over the Straits, Turkish and Soviet diplomats desperately tried to maintain the anti-imperialist understanding uh, of the Black Sea that had once united them. Um, uh, events in, in uh, I will just say one last thing as conclusion. Uh, the scope, so Atatürk's visit and the following negotiations triggered a new round of trade negotiations that began in Moscow in December 1936, reveals how closely Turkey was prepared to align itself with the Soviet Union in economic terms. During the preliminary talks uh, in Moscow, Turkey's ambassador asked for 100 million US dollars from the USSR in a five-year installment plan for the purchase of military equipment. Uh, so much for S-400s, right? The establishment of two new, in, new industrial plants, agricultural development, and the improvement of Black Sea ports for coastal trade. And this loan that the Turkish ambassador proposed would ideally be paid, repaid in 10 years in the form of agricultural produce, totaling 112.5 million US dollars, including interest, right? And as in previous Soviet-Turkish commercial agreements, this is called a net balance agreement. Uh, and it's a little bit different than, it's similar to Nazi Germany's clearing agreement, but it's different for the politi political meanings that were attached to it. And I'd be happy to answer any questions during the Q&A session about it. But, but Turkey, you could see that they imagine a state-sponsored Turkish enterprise to partner with the Soviet trust called Turkstroy, which ran all of the Soviet investments in Turkey, uh, parts of which I explained in my talk two years ago at the Skilleter Center Conference, uh, this uh, Serdar Abatsky Dam project uh, on Eastern Anatolia, also ran by Turkstroy. Um, many of Soviet leaders balked at uh, the Turkish ambassador's request, $100 million on the eve of World War II. It's obviously not something that, that, that the Soviets were um, prepared to accommodate. Um, and it would, for other reasons too, uh, lead them to purchase too many consumer goods. And they, they, they knew that. But nevertheless, the Soviets thought that they could achieve a significant increase in their trade with Turkey. And in their Politburo discussions, if you read the archival Politburo discussions, you can see that they're doing this to also rival Nazi Germany's immense trade influence in Turkey. And, and I can, you know, as early as 1937, uh, you can see Stomanyakov, for instance. Stomanyakov is one of the, you know, leading uh, Soviet figures facilitating these trade negotiations, saying the Germans are preparing for war, uh, Nazi Germans. And they're, they're doing a fantastic job out of it. The German trade empire was very difficult to compete with. And the Soviet Union needed to keep Turkey as a friend and ally against intrusions. And this is the part that brings me to the beginning of my talk to explain to you how Turks, Turks began to look at Russia when they signed 
Soviet Russia, when they signed the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact um, from a very different prison. Uh, and that was, from my reading, uh, partly why Turkey also decided uh, to stay away uh, as a non-belligerent power from World War II. In that sense, they were <clears throat> wedged between two fears uh, within this alliance between uh, Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. There's a lot more I can, uh, I, I can say, but uh, the ability to imagine Soviet-Turkish partnership with a common Black, Black Sea framework was brought to an end, not with the Montreux Convention, but the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. And it was the Soviet Union's alignment with Nazi Germany and not Turkey's compromises to Great Britain for them at the Montreux Convention that ended uh, and that challenged this, the very logic of this um, uh, partnership. Uh, Turkish parliamentary minutes, which are accessible online, during this period contain a plethora of such Kemalist uh, aphorisms as anti-imperialism and independence. The struggle to carve out sovereignty and most importantly economic sovereignty in a world demarcated by European imperialism defined the formation of the Turkish Republic in the 1920s and retained a prominent place in, in Turkey's political discourse in the 30s and the 40s. And Turkey had always looked at, to the Soviet Union, whatever its other faults, as a foil to European great power politics. But Soviet rapprochement with Nazi Germany. Uh, and hence, with the aggressive revisionism that Turkey feared, brought an end uh, to that uh, to that vision. Um, and while the discourse of the national uh, sovereignty was associated exclusively with Western imperialism during the early Kemalist years, it took on a, on a new meaning at the outbreak of the Second World War, and began to reflect uh, Turkey's apprehension vis-à-vis -vis Russian imperialism. Now, thank you for for inviting me. I. I'll stop you. I'm, I know that I already went over way over time, but um, my apologies and thank, thank you. Thank you very much. I've got a, a few questions to start with. Uh, the first is, you mentioned a big leap in economic cooperation post-1936. Why was there a big leap? Sorry, unmute myself. All right. Uh, this is precisely what I was, uh, was, was trying to get at. So uh, after 1933, um, according to Nazi Germany's new economic plan, uh, Nazi Germany tried to reach out to what we call as a third world, to, to places like Turkey and Iran, to expand uh, its clearing agreements, uh, to expand uh, uh, a network of clearing agreements that was very difficult to compete with. Nazi Germany absorbed uh, nearly one third of Turkey's entire trade. The number went up to as high as one half of Turkey's uh, entire trade volume at one point. The Soviet Union was trying to, uh, was trying to compete with this. And, and my, my question is, you know, a, a country like Turkey, why did Inunu relentlessly plead for the Soviet Union to, to, to rival or counterbalance Nazi Germany's uh, trade influence in Turkey. And the question, he explicitly referred to this uh, as, as a political choice, right? So this shows that Turkey's priorities have changed a great deal since the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, which would have been quite content with the number of trade with the Germans, right? They're trying to reach out to the Soviet Union saying, could you please uh, uh, counterbalance this trade volume? And you know, the details, uh, 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 the, the logic behind this is that the, they thought that the Germans were buying these things at a lower price, the agricultural products, to be later dumped at a, at a higher price when, uh, when the opportunity presents itself, which is basically called dumping, right? Uh, and, but not only that, they knew that along with trade, uh, bookstores in Beolu that the Turkish state was closely monitoring and the man of the old German order, the, the Turkish uh, retired Ottoman uh, Pashas and all that, were actually collaborating with, uh, with Nazi, German, Nazi Germany and their propaganda machine that came along with this trade volume. And 
that was a political choice. That the Turks never plead after the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. And in fact, uh, this is something that I discovered last year uh, while looking at the trade volume. I couldn't really believe that because Turkey and the Soviet Union were neighbors. But the trade volume was zero, and I mean zilch, for years until, uh, the until 1953, 54, when it starts picking up a little bit after. Uh, and this is incredible. It's mind boggling, right? I mean, this may be so. This is obviously ignoring the smuggling and cross border trafficking of certain goods through, uh, I don't know, Armenia. Uh, if you've been to Ani, you can see that, you know, the border is right there. And, um, you know, with Iran, different story. But official trade volume uh, went from, uh, uh, from about uh, 6 million Turkish leaders at the time to zero. Uh, in immediately after the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. And so the trade peak after Montreux shows the intent of both governments who saw the, the thread that binds them in economic development and cooperation. These are governments that came from completely different ideologies, which have a lot of geopolitical problems. They're, it's not like they agree on geopolitical issues. The question is, as you properly asked, why are they trying to increase the trade volume? Um, I think uh, the answer has to do with challenging uh, Western hegemony. And the only way to do that is, will be through economic cooperation. I don't know if that answered uh, your question properly. Yeah, thank you. I've got two questions in one next. So I'll, I'll say them both at the same time. The first is, can we argue that a dependence on the British archival material shapes most of the major arguments about Turkish foreign relations in the interwar period? And then secondly, how did the Soviet government react to the Turkish anti-communist stance in this period? Great, great question. Very common. Uh, I will respond to the second one, and I will ask you to clarify the first question again, because I was reading uh, something in a chat window, another question, and I got distracted. But the, the question about uh, Turkey's persecution of communists uh, during this period is something that, that, we, that I commonly receive uh, after lectures or, or, or talks. Uh, the Soviet Union, or the idea to imagine, the, the imagining of the Soviet Union as a state that only does business with uh, socialist countries, or the imagining of the Soviet Union uh, as, a, as a state that tries to convert every state into socialism is completely false. Why did the Soviet Union trade it with China, the nationalist uh, government in China, pre-Mao, right? Why did the, 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 the Soviet Union became the major sponsors of Turkish industrialization during the interwar period? The biggest Turkish industrial projects in Turkey, uh, the biggest push to Turkish industrialization came from the Soviet Union. Why would they invest in a government that they clearly knew were persecuting the communists and they were definitely not, uh, not very friendly to uh, ideologies. I think the answer should not be mine, but, uh, but Litvinov's, uh, second People's Commissar of the Soviet Union for Foreign Affairs, who replaced Georgi Chicherin. Uh, Litvinov came to Para Palace in 1931 uh, and, uh, and then traveled to Ankara for, for negotiations. This was... Uh, you're nearing the peak of Soviet-Turkish friendship in 1931. Uh, and Litvinov came there to start some negotiations of the, the $8 million credit that the Soviet Union extended to Turkey. Uh, Litvinov said that, uh, in Turkish, I'll just say it, which means we are aware that we're not on the same page uh, when it comes uh, to both international politics, that means ge geopolitics, right? But also ideological terms. We uh, are here to challenge a Western dictated international order. And so long as your nationalism, and these are Bolsheviks after the Civil War, who learned, who saw European revolutions failing, who saw the Civil War, uh, in the Soviet Union and who have a different worldview after the Civil War are seeing if, if your nationalism is not blemished, 
by imperialism, that would be our common threat, anti-imperialism. That uh, sometimes is a euphemism for anti-Westernism, uh, which I think that I, not I think, I'm convinced that and I use in my work, uh, that that really brought these two states together. And in some ways, it still does bring uh, these two states uh, together. Anti-imperialism, whenever these two states, I mean, look at Montreux. And so I, I, wasn't, I didn't have uh, the chance to talk about the details of Montreux negotiations, negotiations in Geneva uh, between Tevi Kushto Aras and Maxim Litvinov. Uh, but the biggest disappointment uh, of the Soviet Union was with Tevi Kushto Aras, who claimed, who proclaimed himself as the champion of the Turkish left and Turkish communism, who incessantly spoke in quotation marks for three days and consumed rather not very moderate amounts of uh, liquor, and tried to convince uh, the Soviet, his Soviet uh, partners that he was actually a true believer in anti-imperialism, while also junketing between the British receptions and the French receptions to lobby to establish the, the sovereignty of, uh, of Turkey over the Straits. So the Soviets did not really take it. And I read the reports and it says, Litvinov is asking, Stominyanakov, Karahan, should we take Aras seriously? Is this guy representative of the Turkish state? And they're saying, he definitely is not. Uh, the Soviets are saying, even his friends, uh, so his own ambassador in, in, in Moscow, uh, Ambassador Uphayden, is blaming him for a little bit playing too much for both sides, right? Uh, Orbay, uh, like important uh, characters of the early Republican period are not very on friendly terms with, with Tefi Krushto Aras. Uh, and this, like, I don't want to narrow this story down to only one person, but what I mean, the broad picture is that what I mean is that, uh, um, is that geopolitical conflict was always present uh, in Russian-Turkish relations. Uh, and, and, and somebody asked in the, in the Zoom webinar chat window, you know, the IR reading of history, this monolithic ge emphasis on geopolitics will not tell you what you need to know about Turkey and Russia. It will not tell you about what you need to know about Turkey and the Soviet Union in the, the 30s. It will not tell you about what you need to know about the, uh, about Turkey, in fact, contemporary Turkish-Russian relations, right? Uh, and, I, and I'm convinced after, I don't know, however many, more than a decade or 20 years of reading Russian-Turkish archives, that economic development is what drives these two states and what makes it so significant, right? And it was, uh, what defined the interwar exchange between these two states. Um, the first question, um, uh, uh, the first question I, can, can you remind me about the, the, the first question, uh, Eve? Uh, the first question was, can we argue that a dependence on the British archival material shapes most of the major arguments about Turkish foreign relations in the interwar period? I don't know who said that, but it's exactly what I have been struggling in all my research. Uh, so when you read, uh, with all due respect to our British friends, some t the, the, I've never, I'm yet, I have yet to read more eloquently written diplomatic correspondence. Like I, I've read, you know, I, I lived close by the, the American archives for a decade, uh, and in 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 Washington, and then uh, and I've read, you know, Russian archives, Turkish archives. The British are very eloquent in their internal correspondence. Like it's it's a page turner. But they also smack of rank amateurism in certain regards when they when it comes to uh, understanding the nature of this. So the, the the British are successful in, for instance, in driving a wedge between Soviet Union and Turkey by pulling their weight on Turkey a little bit and supporting the Turkish case when they didn't really have to, right? Uh, and so they were successful. But their analyses and readings of Turkish diplomacy is not necessarily always correct. And if you write as a historian, if British documents are the only documents at your disposal, and you try to write about what Turkey thinks by looking at what Britain thought, Turkey thought, uh, you have a skewed picture. So you need, uh, essentially, uh, Turkish documents, which we don't really have a lot. Um, yeah, but great question. Thank you very much. I think we've run out of time for any more questions. 
but uh, just to let everybody know that registration for the third Ottomans online seminar will be up on the Skeleton Centre website soon, along with the recording of this talk and the first seminar. So thank you all very much for coming and thank you very much, Professor Ishti, for an excellent presentation. And I'll end the webinar now. Thank you so much for inviting me.